the world's most honored is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the vital issues of the hour. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall. Distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. Our guest on the Longines chronoscope this evening is Princess Alexandra Kropotkin, a direct descendant of the first Tsar of old Russia. Her father was exiled from Tsarist Russia because of his liberal views. Princess Kropotkin returned to Russia in 1915, lived there through the early days of the revolution, and it was her fate to be imprisoned by the communists. In time, she escaped to America and has since worked for the liberation of her people. May I present Princess Kropotkin. Our co-editors are Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, political economist and associate editor of Newsweek magazine. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Princess Kropotkin, uh, Secretary Atchison testifying on June 26 before a congressional committee said that America's quarrel today is not with world communism or with the dictators in the Kremlin but with old-fashioned Russian nationalism. He said and I quote, it is clear, he said, that this process of encroachment and consolidation by which Russia has grown in the last 500 years from the Duchy of Moscovy to a vast empire must be stopped. Now, do you agree with that statement of the issue? No, I never agree with Mr. Atchison anyway. That's a Machiavellian statement, and I think a rather bad one. Well, what do you think is wrong with it, primarily? Well, uh, after all, uh, if there weren't communism at the present moment, there wouldn't be... Russian nationalism, imperialism. There'd be a country where there was some kind of, perhaps, democracy for the people. Well, do you think that this uh, view of the subject tends to uh, consolidate the Russian people with Stalin instead of recognizing the fact that a lot of them are opposed to the Stalin regime? Well, 80% are supposed to be opposed and probably more. And I don't think that there are very many Russians as opposed to communists, who are in the least interested in expansion, territorial expansion, or anything of the kind. What, what is the evidence? That's not the danger. Yes. What, what is the evidence, uh, as you see it, that they're that percentage of the Russian people that are opposed to oh, communism? Oh, that's regime? a long story to go into what uh, one considers is the, the... why one considers it's 80%. It's about that. One hears that from people who will, have escaped from Russia, from the quantities of prisoners, from the many sources of evidence, uh, all of which has been collected by various groups now. It's quite a good deal of evidence. Well, what do you think is the main thing that can be done to take advantage of that situation? We have these potential allies in Russia. Well, many things. Propaganda, of course, such as being carried on, uh, perhaps accentuated, um, Propaganda by various radio, free Russia, and so on. Uh, that Princess is Kropotkin. playing quite a part already. Yes, don't. Pardon me, but uh, <coughs> I think the American people would like to hear something from you about actual life in Russia. And one of the things that we hear a great deal about are Russian secret police. Now, in America, where nobody's afraid of a policeman, the average American finds it hard to finds it difficult to believe all the stories we hear about the effectiveness of the Russian police. Now, how, it, how is it possible for the Russian secret police to exert, cause such terror among the people? Well, first of all, it's a quantitative thing. You see, under the Tsars, the secret police, the Okhrana, uh, was a personnel of about 5,000 people. 
In Russia today, there are over two million uh, MCAD, MVD agents and so on. That's the Russian Communist Secret Police. Yes, and, and how, many, how many people, how many Russians would you estimate have been put in concentration camps? Well, that estimate varies. It varies from 12 to 20 million people. And how many were in, in uh, pr how many political prisoners were there in an average year under the Tsar? Oh, the figure never exceeded much over 50,000. It was see. a prison and in exile and so on. You see, you ask how it's possible to have instilled so much terror First of all, there is incredible poverty and so much difficulty and energy goes into every little thing that people need for everyday life. Secondly, there's <coughs> a, uh, a horrible system of spying on one another, which the communists have managed to develop. That's a refinement. That's a, a refinement. moral leprosy. I see. And that's something that's new in the police system. Oh, yes, there was, there were people who denounced others and who uh, spied, but not like it is now. Let me ask you, uh, it, once a, a Russian is put in a concentration camp, is there any hope of release? Do they release them, any of them to come back home? Sometimes, some get out. After they come out, they're usually only allowed to live in certain places, certain towns. Most of them come out in such a fearful state that they are finished anyway, they come out to die. And very few do get out of concentration camps. Really, they aren't concentration camps, they're prison camps. But then the whole of Russia is a prison camp, practically, well, <coughs> anyway. Princess Kropotkin, there's certain facts which, to a lot of Americans, wouldn't seem to jibe with this belief that the large majority of the Russian people are opposed to the regime. For example, they fought very well uh, against Germany. The uh, North Koreans, the uh, Chinese communists are fighting very well. They're not surrendering in mass to uh, the Americans in Korea. They seem to have a very good morale. And if the satellites have that good a morale, it wouldn't it be a good supposition that the Russian soldiers would have an even better morale? Russians have always fought well. They've never been cowards. That's a trait of the Russian people. But you've also got to remember that a great many of the younger people who were born under communism, they don't like the regime. They would welcome something different. But when it comes to fighting an enemy, they'll fight for any kind of government. They always fight. But during World War II, an enormous number of Russians went over and formed even a battalion in Germany to fight back against Russia. They all hoped that the Germans were going to liberate them, and if the Germans had behaved decently to the Russians, they would have had a tremendous number of volunteers. As it was, there were nearly a million. So you think if our propaganda were right and our treatment were right, if we ever did get involved in a war, why we would have wholesale desertions and there would be a quick uh, collapse of the regime there, perhaps? Possibly, yes. Uh, I certainly think that propaganda, when it reaches the Russians, and a great deal of it does now, uh, has an enormous effect. And also, if they knew what was going to happen to them, uh, for, for instance, uh, I don't know if you know this uh, new word that's used, not for deserters, but defectors. Well, now, there were, in 48 and 49, they used to come over to the American zone 50, 60 a day. Now there are only two. And the reason for that is that nothing special has been done for them. They don't know what's going to happen to them if they do desert and come into the American zone. Well, Francis, I'd like to <coughs> ask you just a few questions about the nature of the underground and how we can make it more effective. Now, when I read uh, Gorky and Dostoevsky, I got the impression that the Russians were a natural conspiratorial people, that there was always a, a, a large group that was against the government, and militantly so. Now, today, it, does such a group exist in, the, in Russia? Not as a group, because it's impossible for people to meet together and to talk, to discuss anything. Uh, you'd be either liquidated or in a prison camp if you had ever even thought 
of writing a story about the terrible tempered Mr. Stalin, yes. which you did. Now, uh, well, uh, is there is there a potential underground? Yes, there is. And, now, and, and, uh, and as to ways in which we might encourage it, do you think that our propaganda is effective now? Not as effective as it might be. First of all, there's a religious underground, and that really does exist. Uh, I think that there are quite a few things to be done to step up propaganda. Well, what about the voice of America? Well, you think it's effective? All up to a point, all the, uh, all the radio stations which are carrying news into Russia are effective. Unquestionably, they're reaching many people. But I do think that they might uh, perhaps liven up the stuff yes. a little bit. And <laughs> it's a well, little bit dull. As a final question, I'd like to ask you, Princess Kropotkin, what do you think we could do now to drive a wedge? What's the first step we could take now to drive a wedge between the Kremlin and the Russian people? Well, I'm going to give you a peculiar answer. I think that if the representatives of the Kremlin in this country were treated to a little social ostracism instead of being invited to dinner parties, if they were ridiculed a little, and that went back, on the radio, I think that that might have quite a little effect. And so you would say, in summing up, uh, Princess, you would say that there is a potential underground and that properly encouraged, it can be very hopeful for the Western world. I think so. I think it can be the most hopeful thing in the world because it's probably the only way out of a war. Yes. Well, thank you very much for being with us. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was Princess Alexandra Kropotkin. The little black-mounted magnifying glass that the watchmaker holds like a monocle in his eye is called a loop. After years of observing watches of all kinds, new and old, the man with the loop becomes an excellent judge of watches. And we're proud of the fine letters about Longines watches, which come to us every day from long-established watchmakers. A typical communication reads, The quality of Longines watches is beyond compare. As an experienced watchmaker, the fine workmanship commands my admiration. After years of observation of lawn jeans and other watches, I am convinced that no watch gives so much satisfaction as a lawn jean, nor lasts so long. Yes, indeed. The man with the loop knows why lawn jean watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Superlative quality through and through makes Longines the world's most honored watch. This is Frank Knight inviting you to join us again next week for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, a distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Sold and serviced by more than 4,000 leading jewelers from coast to coast, who proudly display the emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. The world's most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope.
a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Donald I. Rogers, an editor of the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Charles B. Brownson, United States Representative from Indiana. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Congressman Brownson, our chronoscope audience knows you as the young freshman congressman, a Republican from Indiana, who was so instrumental in defeating the uh, Universal Military Training Bill. Now, we all know that the bill has been defeated, but we hear rumors that it's not quite dead and that there may be more uh, news, more activity from that direction. Could you update us on that, sir? Yes, I think I can. As a matter of fact, last week when I was taking the elevator up to the House Chambers, I happened to ride with Carl Vinson, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. At that time, he told me quite off the record that uh, he felt that he would be out with a new UMT bill, which would be so modified that even I could go for it. Do you of course, I had, to, I had to tell him that I doubt that very much, because as long as there's any of that old UMT bill done up in a package, no matter how much cellophane and pink ribbon they put on it, I'm afraid I can't buy that kind of a program. Well, but it shows that they are working on it. Just what's your opposition to the old UMT bill, the administration UMT bill? Oh, yeah, there are a lot of points there, Mr. Rogers. In the first place, it's terribly expensive. The first year will cost over four and a ten, one tenth billion dollars, and after that, it'll cost over two billion dollars a year. The now, two billion year dollars. When? The first year would be the first year it's in effect. Of course. Uh, Mr. Vinson sort of let the cat out of the bag as to the extent he was willing to go in compromising when he introduced his amendment on the floor of the House to make UMT non-effective until 1955. But the expense is a terrible factor. That two and one-tenths billion dollars, for instance, amounts to more money than it costs to send all of the young men and women in the United States that go through college or university to school. Well, well now, sir, let's simplify this just a bit for our audience. Uh, many of whom have uh, young sons. Now, is it true today, sir, that every young man approaching 18, every young American, must anticipate that he'll have to serve some time in military training? I think you're absolutely right, Mr. Huey. Of course, right now, the draft is taking all of the available all right, now whether we call we it have. whether we call it draft or the UMT or whatever we call it, uh, every able-bodied young man has to uh, face some sort of military training now, doesn't he? Right. And uh, so the, uh, your argument, the argument is over what type of military training he's going to get. Isn't that it? is exactly You're right. not opposed to universal no. military training. No, not at all. You're just opposed to the bill. As well, a matter you... of fact, the issue, I think, is very clear-cut. The issue is that we have to find some way of getting non-veteran reservists to replace the veteran reservists uh, on whom we now depend. But before we get to that point, since every man must face it, and there are two plans now for it. One is the government plan, uh, which is uh, being led or <coughs> by Mr. Vinson, or advocated by Mr. Vinson, chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. And the other is your plan, or the plan that's been evolved by you and a group of freshman congressmen in the House. Isn't that, that is correct? right. That's right. Now, uh, how, what are the major differences between the government plan and the plan advocated by the, young, by the freshman congressman? I might put it this way. Ours is uh, evolutionary and theirs is a little revolutionary. We're taking the high school ROTC type of program, which has existed now for many, many years and which now trains 62,000 youngsters all right, now every year in American high Number school. one, their plan would take all young men that go off a train, they'd take them away from home. That is time. correct. Your plan uh, envisions keeping them at home. We keep them at home where they're subjected to their home environment and the influences of home, church, and school. Would they get no uh, military training at a post, a regular military no, camp? No, not at all, Mr. Rogers, because after their two senior years of high school, their junior and senior year, they are then taken to a six-weeks summer camp where they receive training in the particular branch of the service 
which they have chosen or to which they have been assigned. And presumably they would also receive pay for this. They do, week. that's right. They receive but not pay. As, not as ROTC no. students. Yes. All right, now your plan first would keep them at home more. That is right. Now, what is the second advantage that you The second advantage is we do not interrupt his educational progress. Our plan fits into his summer vacation and his normal high school instruction. A young man who's going to take a long technical course in college isn't faced with the possibility of having to extend his education another year because of UMT. I believe Mr. Benson, as the government spokesman, has called your plan the kindergarten plan. Is that a fair criticism? No, I don't think so, because if my plan is the kindergarten plan, Mr. Vinson and his Committee on Armed Services have been engaging in a lot of kindergarten activity for several years because they have had high school ROTC almost since the National Defense Act of 1917 authorized it. And has the high school ROTC plan been uh, uh, called successful by the military? And it the has other? worked very well. Several of the executives on reserve affairs have stated that many of the non-commissioned officers in the early and critical days of World War II and many of the aviation flying cadets were young men who had received their first military training in high school ROTC and who jumped out ahead of the group as a result of that practice. Now, now, you want to keep them at home, sir, and you are also, as a congressman, you've been investigating military expenditures. Now, you, will your plan uh, be less expensive for the taxpayer than the plan advocated by the government? We estimate that it'll only cost about 15% as much. For instance, just to give you an example of what's happening right now, in high school and college, the Department of Defense is able to state that they are training 202,000 141 high school and college ROTC students for a total cost of $20 million. That includes all the instructors, equipment, that type of thing. Out-of-pocket expense is actually running $11.56 a piece a year. All right, now it's now costing... Contrasted to what, sir? Contrasted to the $2,100,000,000 which it will cost to train the trainees under the administration plan, mm -hmm. which calls for one instructor. Well, or each two I mean per student. Now you say this is eleven dollars and fifty six cents per student? That's eleven fifty six plus about a hundred dollars that comes out of the twenty million. Yes. All right, now what would the UMT, the administration's UMT plan about cost? Twenty eight about twenty eight hundred dollars to train one student for six months, which I think is a little high because I understand you can go to Harvard or Yale for eighteen or nineteen hundred dollars for a whole school year very months. comfortably. Yeah, that's right. Now, it, it costs $2,800 tr for the government to train one young man for six months. That is right. And it cost $1,800 for a young man to go to Harvard for nine months. That's right. And uh, you, you think that that's too much money. I think something is wrong. I think there's a lot of empire building in there. A lot of new commands will be created and, and a lot of extra staffs and a lot of high commanders. Well, do you contend stars. that the military training, the child, or, or you can't <laughs> call him a child, the young man, the student, will receive under your program will be comparable or as good as the military training he'd receive? Yes, I absolutely do. If you stick to basic training, which is the only thing Congress ever authorized in Public Law 51, which is the basic mm -hmm. legislation behind this whole plan, that's what we used to call branch immaterial That's training. That's right, in the exactly. Yes. I see I have a comrade in arms here. <laughs> As a matter of fact, this whole scheme grew up through our belief that if you can take a young man and give him four years of college ROTC, six weeks of summer camp, and commission him as a second lieutenant to lead men in combat, you can certainly make a private out of a young man in the last two years of high school with a six-week summer camp. Now, it has worked in the past, and I can't see why. We used to make stop. second lieutenants in 17 weeks. <laughs> That's right. And now, some pretty good ones, I might add. Now, Congressman, uh, you and your colleagues are freshmen, uh, Congressman. Yes. And uh, you're challenging some of these old-timers who've been on the Armed Services Committee for 30 years. Now, what is there in your background that leads you to think that you might be an expert in this field? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm very humble about that whole thing. You see, as close as I can figure, Mr. Carl Vincent came into the Congress the day I was born. <laughs> we offered this plan to the Armed Services Committee for their study. We offered this plan to the American Legion for study. We have tried to work with all of these groups that exist as far as we possibly can. But we are very proud that the common sense, practical approach of our plan made it successful in carrying the voice vote and the televote on the floor of the House of Representatives meeting as the Committee of the Whole. Have you had training as a psychologist? 
Yes, I have. My college work is in psychology, and as a matter of fact, I was a personnel consultant on military duty have at you the start of my five-year service in World War II. All of us who drafted this plan, you see, have seen this thing, not from the standpoint of the boys with the stars and the boys with the white gold and the cuffs, but all of us have been on the underside, training men and being trained. That and we not think that gives the us the perspective. <clears throat> By and large, the Armed Services Committee is composed of a majority of non-veterans. Now, sir, we'd like, uh, uh, finally, we'd like you to give us your prediction as to what will happen in this struggle between the two systems, the government and the one what you're advocating. Well, my prediction is that the American people are going to evidence a continued interest. We have never had a flood of mail such as we had on UMT. If the American people want an American plan of UMT instead of a European-Asiatic type plan, all they've got to do is let their own congressman know, and he's sitting down there waiting in Washington, waiting to hear from them, and he'll do what they want. Well, because in the wonderful American tradition, this is an election year. Well, thank you, Mr. Brownson. I'm sure that our audience has appreciated your views. Thank you for being with us, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Donald I. Rogers. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Charles B. Brownson, United States Representative from Indiana. Do you have the problem of selecting a gift of great prestige for someone important to you? That problem is most happily solved with Longines, the world's most honored watch. Because of the outstanding quality of the watch itself, and because of what the name Longines stands for. To the whole world, Longines stands as the only watch in history to win the highest of all awards 38 times at World's Fairs and International Expositions, including 10 grand prizes and 28 gold medals. Longines also stands for the watch of first choice in sports, aviation, science, and other fields of precise timing. Longines stands for the only watch to be classified first at the four great government observatories, Washington, Geneva, Q. Teddington, and Neuchâtel. The gift of great prestige for any important occasion is Longines, the world's most honored watch. And throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much. And yet, you may buy and own, or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world's honored Longines. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. The world's most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. 
Mr. Donald I. Rogers, an editor of the New York Herald Tribune, and Mr. Victor Rizel of the New York Daily Mirror. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Christian A. Herter, United States Congressman from Massachusetts. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Congressman Herter, our audience knows of you as a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and as a leading Republican in Congress. Uh, I wonder if you'd speak to us, sir, tonight a bit about the foreign affairs of our nation. I think perhaps the most pressing foreign problem, or perhaps the most talked of foreign problem, is whether or not General Eisenhower will run for president, as a Republican, of course. Well, there, obviously, I've got to express my own opinion. I happen to be very enthusiastic for General Eisenhower as a candidate for the, on the Republican ticket. And my feelings about the general can very briefly be explained by the fact that I think he's got a concept of the importance of our foreign relations today that is unequaled by many people in public life. And I have the very deep conviction that our foreign relations condition almost everything that happens in our domestic affairs. Okay. In other words, that today, our the conduct of our foreign affairs is the most important factor in our domestic life. Well, Congressman, you say the general has concepts. Well, he has been asked by virtually everybody what those concepts are. Uh, if he's not declaring, at least, can you tell us what he stands for on, on foreign problems and on domestic problems? If he becomes president, he has to run this country. What does General Eisenhower stand for? Well, Mr. Rizal, there, obviously, I'm in the same position as any other private citizen. I can quote his published works. I could tell you that I've talked to him as an individual and convinced myself that he's got an extraordinarily clear picture of where our role in this world is conditioned by the relationships with other, other countries. Nobody can speak for him. He's going to have to speak for himself. When will that be, Congressman? Well, I'm convinced that it will come fairly soon after the Lisbon Conference that comes early in February. But that is the time where he has got to make at least his last appearance as a Commander-in-Chief in Europe. Now, I'm, again, speaking without authority, I'm guessing. But I think it will come very soon after is that. Is there any political significance in the United States, any political events which might uh, hasten his decision in declaring himself? Well, there are a number of things that are happening automatically in our political life. The New Hampshire primaries come on the 10th of March. Under the New Hampshire law, at the end of January, the 29th of January to be exact, the Secretary of State of New Hampshire has got to notify any potential candidate whose name may go on the ballot, and Eisenhower will certainly go on the ballot in New Hampshire, that he has 10 days in which to withdraw his name from the ballot if he sees fit to do so. But don't the Democrats have the same prerogative? They have the same prerogative, and I think at that stage of the game, the general has got to make up his mind whether he's willing to have his name go on the Republican ballot and whether he's willing to have it taken off the Democratic Either ballot. or, huh? Well, Congressman, Either there's or. been uh, a great deal of conjecture, and obviously you're convinced he's going to stand for the presidency of the United States if he can get the Republican nomination. Do you think he can get the nomination if he declares? Yes, I do. I think he's been handicapped. I think he's been handicapped by factors that are entirely outside of his own control. And one of them that I'm rather bitterly critical of that I'd like to talk about is the slowness with which our own productive capacity in this country has been turning out armaments that could be used in the setting up of the European army. How does this affect the general? It affected very much because the whole time schedule on which he was supposed to operate from the point of view of a unified command and the arming of the minimum number of divisions has been set way back by our own slowness. In Could we have hastened that? Is, hasn't this time lag been due to tooling up? The time lag has not been due to tooling up. The time lag, that is an excuse that is given. But I think you'll find when you analyze the picture that the time lag has been due to perfectionists in the military establishment who've not been satisfied with any given tank any given plane, any given gun, they've always wanted to make a better one, and so they've never given firm orders 
to turn out something which could be sent to Europe or sent to Indochina or for that matter do sent to Korea. Do the Russians force our hand on this? Do the Russians keep producing better tanks, guns, planes? They do planes, certainly. Well, they keep producing them. What we have been doing, unfortunately, has been diddling a good deal with the perfectionist designs that we wanted to turn out well, ourselves. Well, in blueprints. And for that reason, I think we're at least 10 months to a year behind what we should have been from the point of view of the appropriations that Congress made. Well, Congressman Herder, then you think that the uh, uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization is a failure, uh, oh, no. don't you? No. You say it has no armament? Not by a long shot. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization had a long way to go. When you're putting together the armed forces of a great many different nations under a unified command, you've got a tremendous number of problems dealing with national pride, national sovereignty, the pay schedules of the different non-commissioned officers, the officers, and everything that is connected with making a unified whole of a conglomerate mass of different nationalities. Well, that brings up the point That's of Mr. Churchill. Way. Mr. Churchill says that he will uh, throw in with us in NATO if we keep Mr. Or General Eisenhower at the command of the European operation, uh, which sort of puts Mr. Churchill in the role of supporting Taft. No, it doesn't. It keeps Britain out if the general declares. Is he going to declare or is he going to stay and Mr. Churchill will come in if he goes out? Well, I think, I think you're dealing now with what has been termed in days gone by as an iffy question. Well, I don't think that, that uh, those two things are definitely related. In other words, I think that General Eisenhower can get this picture in such shape that he can very properly retire and let a competent successor carry on. And uh, that you talk about the, about the individual that is the uh, sine qua non of an effective organization I don't believe in. But, Congressman, that's not an iffy question. Uh, the Prime Minister of the British Empire, Winston Churchill, is a very determined man. He says he doesn't go in if the general goes out. Now, uh, the general may declare, but what happens to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization if England doesn't come through? Well, you're a better judge of the timing of a news story than I am. Thank you, sir. On the other hand, Churchill's statement was made two days ago, and then it was followed by a very succinct statement as to his attitude toward the, the armament problem in Europe and the relationship of a unified Europe. And I have a feeling that his second statement completely overshadowed the first, and that the first, dealing with the inevitability of Eisenhower remaining in the picture, has now been superseded. May I ask this, uh, if the general runs, I don't think this question has ever yet been asked, uh, who will he run with? Uh, you're high in the Republican ranks, you're booming Eisenhower for president. Have you people considered a running mate for General Eisenhower? No, and I don't think that that is something that needs to be considered at this moment. The convention time is still six months away. Uh, frankly, my, co my primary consideration is getting Eisenhower nominated in the first instance. You have some doubt of that? Well, I've got doubt about that because you've got certain factors today that are working against Eisenhower in the picture, and let's not minimize them. Which of those, sir? Well, today, with these scandals that are developing, day after day, that are undermining people's faith in the administration's ability to carry on an honest administration in the tax department, in a lot of various departments, the post office department, other departments of the government, there is a growing conviction that the Republicans can win with any ticket whatsoever. A dangerous supposition, isn't it? I mean, for the Republicans. Well, from my point of view, it is. Yeah. I think we've been deluded by that same illusion, if you want to call it that, before. before? Yeah. I, don't, I don't want to see us do it again. And by any candidate, you mean Senator Taft? Well, I mean Senator Taft, and I'm not minimizing Senator Taft as an individual. I've been a personal friend of his for 30 years, but Senator Taft is a fine individual who, from the point of view of the ordinary rules of the game, would be entitled to the nomination for his contribution to the party. Do you think he can win, sir? If not My right. principal reason for feeling so strongly about Eisenhower as a very able and competent person is that I think that he can win and that he has a very much better chance of winning and I think that's terribly important from the point of view of the future of this country. Well, Congressman Herder, we certainly appreciate you coming with us. <coughs> you have enlightened us a good deal about General Eisenhower's chances and his campaign. We appreciate you being with us tonight. Thank you, sir.
The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. Donald I. Rogers and Mr. Victor Rizel. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Christian A. Herter, United States Congressman from Massachusetts. The worldwide prestige of Longines watches is proof of their unsurpassed dependability and accuracy. These qualities are the result of the extraordinary excellence in the design and the manufacture of the Longines watch movement, the beating heart of every Longines watch. Here is the matured product of the skill and experience acquired through 85 years of watchmaking. The ultra slow motion camera reveals the smooth, flawless mechanism of the Longines balance assembly the guardian of the accuracy of the watch. Through his magnifying glass, the skilled watchmaker sees, in addition, the precious hand finishing of essential parts, which makes the Longines watch so superior, so outstanding. Yes, there are tangible reasons why Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. When next you buy a watch, for yourself or as a gift, remember, if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, you're paying the price of a Longine, and you should insist on getting a Longine, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight again reminding you that the Longines Chronoscope is brought to you three times weekly, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So won't you join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display the emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the art. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is David Ross. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope, Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Richard Waddell, Management Editor of Business Week magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Clifford Case, United States Representative from New Jersey. Mr. Case, many of our viewers, of course, know that you are a veteran congressman from uh, Rawway, New Jersey. You've been in Congress since 1944, haven't you? That's right. And uh, particularly during the last few weeks, You've been a part of Operation Commodore. You've been a part of these uh, people who've been sitting down in the Commodore Hotel and uh, getting the new administration ready to uh, take over. Now, sir, there's a lot of public interest in, in what you've been doing at the Commodore. And the first question is this, sir. Is all of this organization work that you've been doing for the new administration, is this an unprecedented effort? Has it ever happened before? So far as I know, it is unprecedented. Uh, certainly nothing like this has happened uh, in the past 20 could, years. Could you give our viewers some indication of the size of the effort? How many people have been em employed in it? Uh, right now, I guess that we're about at the peak, and I think there's something like 125 people there altogether. Uh, the great bulk of, of, of that uh, consists of clerical help, uh, and then there are uh, several uh, people in a rather special category, like Hugh Scott and myself, uh, most of the rest of the uh, men are people who are going 
into the new administration. Now, uh, now you've been, uh, everybody from General Eisenhower and Mr. Dulles on down, uh, 125 of you have been reporting there for work every morning since the election and, and working? Pretty much, you, pretty much. Your job, uh, I understand, part of your job at least has been to uh, uh, collect some money to pay for this. Uh, yes, uh, that, uh, that... Who, uh, who will fi pay the final bill, or are the bills paid? Uh, they're not all paid, but they, I'm sure they all will be paid. Uh, we have had to raise money for this uh, for this headquarters. Uh, there isn't any federal appropriation for it, and it's an expensive thing to have uh, 55 rooms now. Are you and, in favor uh, of a federal appropriation for such a, a shift, uh, this in uh, interim period? Well, there, there are various possibilities, it seems to me, and uh, they all ought to be explored. Uh, I'm not sure that <clears throat> I can see quickly any reason why there should be such a long delay between Election Day and Inauguration Day. Uh, and and uh, the purpose, of, of course, of the whole operation is to make this transition from one administration to another as smooth as possible without any lag. How much does the operation cost, sir? What's well, been the, the weekly cost of it? Uh, it has gradually increased as the president-elect uh, has named additional uh, people to his staff, and they have come to the headquarters and taken up their duties. Uh, right now, I expect it's something like in the neighborhood of twenty-five thousand dollars a week. And and how are you paying the twenty-five thousand now? How are you paying well, part of it? A, a considerable amount. Uh, I don't know exactly what it uh, would total. Has been raised just by people who have sent in subscriptions, uh, uh, contributions, uh, knowing uh, that the organization is in existence and is needs funds. Is there any possible ground for criticism of such an operation or for financing it in such a manner? It seems to me that uh, there is no proper ground, and I've heard no suggestion of criticism. You haven't had any difficulty in collecting any of the money, have you? No, but there hasn't been an organized drive mm -hmm. to raise money. Your, uh, your efforts have been some, uh, in some fields directed in another way. Uh, oh, yes. You have uh, done some other things. Uh, there's been some talk that you've uh, uh, been uh, looking over the congressional list to find out those who you think might be the proper uh, men to uh, carry out some of Eisenhower's program. Well, I, I ought to say right now, uh, that uh, my position and uh, and uh, Congressman Scott's position too uh, has not been that mm -hmm. uh, we are not in any way assigned to that to that job by the administration uh, or the incoming administration. Uh, we are there uh, to do everything that has to be done for which our experience and, and you have some ideas on how the uh, uh, rapprochement <coughs> rapprochement between Taft and Eisenhower is going to work out. Uh, do you think it will be smooth? I have every confidence that. Uh, that uh, there will be a complete, completely harmonious uh, uh, operation between well, Senator Taft and, and Congress in general, well, and the President. Senator, uh, Congressman, since you have, since you are an original Eisenhower man, and since you've had all this experience in helping to prepare the way for the new administration, I'm sure that you can give our viewers some valuable hints as to what to expect when the show moves on down to Washington on the 20th. Now, sir, specifically, uh, is anything dramatic likely to happen uh, during the first few weeks after Eisenhower becomes president? Well, in the sense that I think your question implies, no. Uh, there has been a very dramatic uh, happening extended over the period beginning uh, about 8.30 on uh, election day uh, and continuing right on now, and it's going to continue. But in the sense of, of, of dramatic and spectacular uh, moves, uh, I don't think that uh, that they are in the Nay. in the wind. This is going to be a, a process which uh, uh, is a solid uh, accomplishment rather than a spectacular one. The war in Korea is not likely to end quickly, or taxes to be reduced drastically, or any New Deal legislation be repealed. Suddenly. Do you think that they'll? Uh, uh, well, uh, Mr. Huey, I, I'm sure that the kind of thing that your question implies is not going to happen that way. I, I know uh, in my I have the deepest confidence that we are going to get the war in Korea ended sooner than we would otherwise. Uh, the taxes will come down sooner than otherwise they would. Uh, and that uh, sound legislative programs are going to be enacted and good things carried out and developed further. But I don't look for uh, a lightning stroke of the kind I think you mean. Yes. Well, there will be differences, uh, uh, undoubtedly. Well, one of the differences, and the one, one that I'm interested in, is the, the uh, business uh, men who have uh, gone to Washington, er, well, gone to the Commodore and will be going to Washington. Uh, do you think that their uh, organization of the, of the executive branch of the government uh, will uh, improve and even save money for the government as a, an operation? 
I'm sure that the administration uh, will do that uh, and that the uh, wisdom and ability uh, that, that the leaders from business whom Eisenhower is, is, is uh, putting in his cabinet and in his administration will be of great help in that direction, yes. Now, sir, who are the, who are the brain trusters of this new administration? Well, uh, that again implies that there's a little coterie of people behind the scenes who are running the show. And uh, I couldn't, uh, if, if there were such, and, uh, and I knew about it, I wouldn't be able to say so. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't believe there is that kind of thing. And what I'm striking at, sir, and I'm trying to get at, uh, this has been billed as a new era. Something new is happening in Washington on January the 20th. For most people uh, now, most American adults, and for most people less than 50 years old, there's nothing like this has happened since 1932. That's right. That's right. Now, uh, can you illustrate for our viewers uh, what the difference is going to be between this new admin Republican administration and what we've had for the past 20 years? <clears throat> well, we've had for the past, at least the latter part of this 20 years, an administration that's been running down, an administration that, by the weight of its accumulated mistakes and, and uh, the mere fact that it's been in office so long, has been getting slower and slower, grinding to a halt. And we now have, uh, uh, coming into office on the 20th of January, uh, pres presaged by the uh, Republican Congress, which took office last Saturday, uh, an administration that is fresh, and comes with vigor, with none of the handicaps or the barnacles that have attached to the old one, and with a complete dedication to the single purpose of doing the best possible job in foreign affairs and in domestic affairs, and no entanglements. What? And I, I, I have the greatest confidence that the results, uh, which are expected, are going to, to be realized. One of the problems that some people think that the Eisenhower administration will face, perhaps in 1953, is a, uh, a recession. Now, you have uh, said in your campaign speeches for re-election in New Jersey that uh, the Republican Party must do nothing to earn the, uh, uh, the title of the uh, uh, Depression Party or the Party of Privilege or the uh, indifference towards the uh, general public. Uh, will they move uh, quickly if there's any sign of that? If there is any sign of that sort, uh, I am sure the administration will take all proper and necessary action. Uh, Actually, in my talks uh, to which you refer, uh, I was talking about a reputation uh, rather than an actuality, uh, something that, uh, uh, that had been successfully foisted on us uh, by certain branches of the Democratic Party uh, in many people's minds. And, uh, and I was pointing out uh, that we should not accept that well, no, uh, and, and must not, and I'm sure we, we, we will not do anything to justify well, it. Well, Mr. Case, you are a, a very influential New Jersey politician in your own right, sir. In a, in a very limited area. <laughs> and uh, from a very fine district. That's now, true. What, what have you promised your district to get them down there during this in this new Congress? I'm a very lucky congressman, because mine is not a pork barrel district in any sense. We have no great public works that are desired and none that are there. Uh, you mean your district doesn't want anything? Well, my district wants, pardon me, this is not saying that it's got it, but it wants just good, solid representation, uh, which... They must think you were uh, solid representation since you led Eisenhower in the, in the, uh, the district by about 10,000 votes. Uh, I'm sorry, you started this now. <laughs> <laughs> and let those facts speak for themselves. That was a little bit special, and there were special reasons for that. Do you accept the candidacy for governor? As some people uh, say that you were going to be offered that. Well, that would be a most flattering offer. I don't believe anybody in political life would turn it down, but I'd prefer to wait till it was offered before I say yes. Then. As a final question, sir, uh, uh, it, it's been said that the new administration is going to be weak on uh, on politicians. It is going to have a lot of businessmen, but there aren't going to be any very experienced politicians in the administration itself. Now, do you think that there's going to be a shortage of politicians? No, not in the right sense. Uh, both in the in the in the uh, administration itself and the executive side uh, and of course in Congress where we have experienced politicians, men from way back who know the trade and properly. Uh, I, I am sure that we will get to, we will have no difficulty in handling the political side of this thing in a proper well, way. Well thank you very much for being with us this evening, sir. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight are entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and uh, 
Mr. Richard Waddell, Management Editor of Business Week magazine. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Clifford Case, United States Representative from New Jersey. Discriminating people the world over find in Longines the qualities they seek in a very fine watch. Greater accuracy, for instance. Now, the record of Longines watches in observatory accuracy competitions is unexcelled. Over the years, Longines watches have established many records, won countless awards for individual watches and series of watches in the great observatories, Neuchâtel, Geneva, Washington, Hugh Teddington, and of course, Longines is the only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medal awards. If you too are interested in a watch of superior quality, either for yourself or as an important gift, you will choose well to choose Longines, the world's most honored watch. For a Longines watch offers you exclusive styling, impressive appearance, greater accuracy, and the assurance of a long, long life. Yet you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is David Ross, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Franklin D. Roosevelt, Jr., United States representative from New York. Well, Mr. Roosevelt, we're very happy to welcome you to the Chronoscope program this evening. I'd like to begin by asking you what you thought of the charges that Senator McCarthy made against uh, Governor Stevenson. Well, Mr. Hazlitt, first of all, may I express my gratitude for your inviting me here tonight. As for the McCarthy speech tonight, I unfortunately was not able to see all of it, hear all of it. I did uh, get the last part of it where uh, the senator from Wisconsin was once again uh, bringing in the affidavit that uh, Governor Stevenson made in the Hiss trial, in which, of course, Governor Stevenson testified in writing by his affidavit, only to the fact that when he knew Hiss in the State Department, Hiss then had a reputation, a good reputation in the community. And that was all. Uh, but Senator McCarthy, as usual, uh, tried to read much more into it. Now, well, sir. do you think that uh, Governor Stevenson showed good judgment in making that deposition? I think that as an attorney and as a citizen uh, in our procedure of justice in the courts, uh, he had had an obligation to state what he knew about the reputation his had in the community at that time. It was not his uh, opinion of his, his reputation, it was his uh, opinion of the reputation his had in the community at that time. Well, granted that uh, he had the duty to speak if he thought that a uh, perjurer was a loyal citizen, uh, did it show good judgment in thinking that? Well, of course, uh, he had not been convicted of perjury at the time that uh, Governor Stevenson made that uh, affidavit. Uh, that was the decision of the jury 
uh, after the Hiss trial. Well, and you the think first Hiss trial was a hung jury, you know. Well, do you think it would show that Governor Stevenson can't tell a communist when he sees one, so to speak? No, I don't think it don't shows think that so. at all. Well, <laughs> I think now, that's what McCarthy would like it to show. On the McCarthy speech, sir, uh, do you think that it might be effective for the Republicans? Well, not having heard the whole speech, I can't say. I don't think that McCarthy is effective for the Republicans for one very simple reason, that I think the American people have realized that McCarthy has crucified the character and the reputation without evidence of too many Americans. And secondly, that not one single person has been convicted as a result of Mr. McCarthy's uh, efforts. Well, now, the on. Justice Department at the same time has convicted 33 well-known communist leaders. Well, moving on to the, to the campaign, sir, uh, I believe that you at least made one favorable statement about General Eisenhower in 1948. Did you in March not? of 1948, I did make a statement saying that I felt that General Eisenhower could unify the country. Now, I sir, when, when did your uh, enthusiasm begin to lag for General Eisenhower? Within the three weeks that followed that statement, I discovered that the impressions that I had of uh, General Eisenhower's position on the issues uh, could not be verified, and that General Eisenhower did n neither uh, would express himself on the issues, nor was he a candidate. Where did those impressions come from, Mr. Roosevelt? That was 1948. I'd say that they probably were a general idea that people had about the fact that Eisenhower at that time uh, ha certainly was a very humane and a great military leader and uh, certainly was highly respected both here and, and throughout the world. I think he still is respected and, and admired as a great military leader. Well, now, about the campaign that the Democrats have waged against General Eisenhower, do you feel, sir, that uh, any of the charges leveled at him have been unfair? Well, I uh, haven't documented all the charges that have been leveled against him. I've been pretty busy being positive in this campaign on behalf of Governor Stevenson and, of course, my own re-election. I'd say that uh, the main charge against General Eisenhower has been not that he has failed to repudiate McCarthy and Jenner, who crucified uh, his own great uh, hero, General Marshall, uh, but that he has positively gone out and endorsed these people, the very essence of the old God Republicans. And I think that the charge that he is now a captive of the old God is a justified charge. I think that can be shown by his acceptance of Senator Taft's prepared statement, prepared in Cincinnati, and he brought it to uh, Columbia for his meeting with Eisenhower, and Eisenhower accepted it. Well, is it for a great crime for Mr. Eisenhower, who is running on a Republican ticket, to be supporting, so to speak, the views of Mr. Republican? Well, he, uh, he conquered Mr. Republican at Chicago and then was conquered by Mr. Republican at Columbia University. I don't think it's a crime. Of course not. He's, <laughs> this is a free country. I don't think it will help him, though, with the American people, because I don't think that Senator Taft is... A, well, he wasn't nominated by the Republicans, so he doesn't even have the Republican well, support. Sir, two questions on President <coughs> Truman. In the first place, sir, do you think that any of Truman's tactics have been unfair in this campaign? I think that uh, it's hard to say that they're unfair for the simple reason that we know Harry Truman is a tough fighter in any campaign. That's how he won the election in 1948. I think that some of the things he has said have hurt some people, uh, their sensitivities. On the other hand, I think he has aroused the Democratic Party and I think that his uh, campaigning has been helpful. Well, I'm well, sure... Mr. I... Roosevelt, I'd like to ask this question, whether that isn't applying a sort of double standard. Now, uh, why can't you say about Senator McCarthy, he's a tough fighter and he's been effective? Uh, why is it all right, let well, us I say, for... Well, I don't think you ought to compare uh, Truman to well, McCarthy. Why, well, I'm asking you why you apply what seems to me a double standard of, uh, of uh, innuendo. How about the uh, innuendo that Mr. Truman made that uh, General Eisenhower was anti-Semitic and anti-Catholic? He so didn't... On. Now, uh, wait a minute. He did not say that. We well, made the innuendo, I no. said. What he said was that... And actually, he didn't even deliver the speech himself, although he approved the speech. What he said was that General Eisenhower was now endorsing positively those men who had passed and supported the McCarran bill, which is selective and anti-racial.
Mr. Roosevelt. It's anti-Polish, it's anti-Italian, it's anti-Eastern European, and so forth. Well, Governor Stevenson hasn't been repudiating any of the candidates who, the Democratic candidates who favored the McCarran bill. There's a difference bill, between he? repudiation and endorsement. That's all that Truman said, that Eisenhower has gone out of his way to endorse these candidates. Well, hasn't Mr. Stevenson endorsed some of the people who voted for the McCarran Act, the Democrats? I, I don't know. Yes. I don't uh, know if uh, Governor Stevenson has endorsed anybody. Yes. It hasn't been heralded, such as the endorsements Mr. of McCarthy and <coughs> Mr. Roosevelt, so I'm sure that our viewers want to know something about you and your own campaign. So you, after all, you represent one of the big west side districts in New York City. Right. Now, how's, yeah, your own, how's your own campaign going? Well, I've been spending five days a week, uh, four or five meetings a night, uh, meeting with my constituents, discussing the issues with them. I have a very interesting district. It's a very independent district. I'd say that it is liberal, it's progressive. Of course, I hope they uh, re-elect me to Congress. Well, uh, well, you won on a Four Freedoms uh, platform, didn't you? The uh, first yes. time I ran, I, I ran on the Liberal Party candidacy yes. and also the Independent Four Freedoms Party it, candidacy. It's a traditionally democratic uh, constituency, isn't it? No, I'd say that it's traditionally independent. Uh, in, in 1949, they elected me. I was not the Democratic candidate. Uh, then they voted for uh, Mayor Impelatieri quite overwhelmingly when he ran as an independent in 1950. And they voted for uh, Mr. Halley when he ran as an independent and a Liberal Party candidate in 1951. And uh, one other question about the family, sir. I believe that uh, one of your brothers is supporting General Eisenhower. Now, yes. Is this unusual, a, a defection in the Roosevelt family like this? No, I, I don't think it's particularly unusual. We practice what we preach in the uh, Roosevelt family. We believe in freedom of speech freedom of thought, and the right of everyone to express himself freely and if he feels called upon to do so. I Frankly, though, I don't think Johnny's going to influence any votes. I don't think I am, <laughs> but I think my mother is. Well, what are, is your mother taking an active part in the last few days of the campaign? She certainly is. She's introducing Governor Stevenson to the Madison Square Garden rally tomorrow night. And as, as a final question, Mr. Roosevelt, uh, do you expect any dramatic moves in the last part of the campaign? No, I don't look for any dramatic moves. Uh, I think that General Eisenhower shot his wad when he said he'd go to Korea personally. What he'd do when he got there, he didn't say. I think that the American people will vote to continue the prosperity under the Democrats and continue the hope for peace in the world through the United Nations, the Point Four program, well, and NATO. Well, thank you, sir, for being with us. Thank you. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight are entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Franklin D. Roosevelt, Jr., United States Representative from New York. During the past weeks, the words of some of our speakers, spoken during the heat of the political campaign, have evoked considerable comment and occasional criticism. Now, at this time, the Longines Whitnor Watch Company puts aside its usual commercial message to give our editors an opportunity to explain to you the policy of the Longines Chronoscope. For this purpose, we present Mr. William Bradford Huey. As a magazine editor, about uh, once a year, I give a policy statement to the readers. And tonight, as an editor of the Chronoscope, I'll give a policy statement to you. Longines Whitnor began this program, first on a once a week basis, and now for more than a year we've operated three times a week uh, over a very large nationwide network. And we are pleased that uh, so many of you have liked the program. Now here's what we do. Regardless of political persuasion, we bring the most important people in America right into your living room. We seat them comfortably and then in a forthright but friendly manner, we ask them the questions that we think you would like to ask. And in doing this, we take risk. It's a hazardous business of bringing a, a guest into other people's living rooms. And sometimes when we bring a rather controversial character on one side or the other, uh, you don't like him. And a great many of you protest. Now when this happens, we are sorry. But quite honestly, uh, what can we do? Neither I, nor the sponsors, nor the network exercise any control over what's said. We are not censors. 
we have to take the risk, you and I, of free speech. We ask the questions and you take the risk to get what answers you get. Then too, we editors are, are often criticized because we don't rip into some guest, because we don't try to refute what he has to say or to embarrass him. And I particularly uh, get criticized because as a writer, I have some reputation as a ripper. But here, we don't do any ripping. We don't smash any ink wells. And we are quite proud of the fact that in all our programs, we've never had a guest who went away thinking that he'd been treated unfairly. So during our second year, we expect to bring you stimulating, provocative views from the most active men and women in the world. You examine them. You look into their eyes on these big TV close-ups and you decide what you think of them. Now that's our policy. Thank you. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longine and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watson. Jean Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of. Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Gunther Stuhlman, associate editor of the American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Frederick R. Couder, Jr. United States Congressman from New York. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Kudair, our audience of course knows that you are a distinguished and veteran member of the Congress of the United States. And tonight, uh, since there is a lot of interest in the presidential campaign, uh, some of our audience, uh, I'm sure, would like to know something of the problems of the 435 congressmen who are running for re-election. Now, you, of course, are standing for re-election in your district, are you not, sir? Uh, that is quite right, uh, And for your, for your fourth term, I believe it is? I'm completing a third term and running for the fourth term. That's quite right. And what is your district, sir? The 17th uh, district of New York that runs up and down the middle of Manhattan, on the east side largely, and part of it runs straight through to the East River from Fifth Avenue, and it goes down uh, below Washington Square. Now, is that known as one of the silk stocking districts in New York? It was known as a silk stocking district when people wore silk stockings, but nobody wears stockings anymore, so I think possibly that's not... It, would you say it's a typical district in, in uh, the metropolitan area? I think it's a fair cross-section of the population of mid-Manhattan. Mr. Kudair, do you think that uh, now with Mr. Eisenhower having been uh, nominated as the Republican presidential candidate, that your chances for your own re-election have improved? Well, I have very little doubt <coughs> that with the ticket that we've got now, headed by uh, General Eisenhower and my former colleague in the House, Senator Nixon, uh, that... Uh, we're going to win. I'm quite sure that uh, in my own district, the Republicans will carry all offices from the president down. You are a Republican. Do you think that uh, General Eisenhower is proving himself to be a good campaigner in the coming... I think he started off in great shape. Uh, I think the uh, exchange between the president and the general uh, the last 24 hours about the invitation to... Uh, uh, 
uh, visit the White House and put Truman's uh, yoke around his neck at the start were very much to the credit of the general. It showed he was very much on the job and very alert to the issues. You, you don't uh, believe then, as some critics have charged, that uh, General Eisenhower may not uh, be the type of man who can make the case against the Democratic Party? By no means. I think he'll make the most of it, and I think he'll supply the most effective leadership. I think we're going to have a fine, smashing campaign that's going to result in victory, myself. And you think that, uh, that most of the, uh, of the Republican uh, members of Congress who are carrying on their campaigns in their own districts, that they are, are satisfied with the national ticket and the help that they will get from the national ticket? As far as I've been in contact with them, yes, of course, I can't speak for all 435. Well, now, in New York, New York State, of course, is a pivotal state in this election, and there's a great deal of conjecture as to how the state will go. Now, in 1948, I believe the state uh, went for Governor Dewey, but uh, that was largely because, uh, or may have been because, Mr. Wallace was running and polled a very large vote. Now, this year, without a third ticket in the, uh, in the picture, uh, how do you think New York State's likely to go? Well, obviously, it will be a good deal more difficult to carry New York without uh, the help of a split in the opposition. But I think uh, all of our Republicans are going to stand firmly together. Uh, I think they're going to make this fight without reservation. I think the issues are very great and very important. And I'm personally uh, confident that the people of New York will appreciate the issue sufficiently uh, to throw out the Democratic administration in Washington and elect General Eisenhower. Well, now, the, uh, the, the uh, various voting groups in New York, do you think that General Eisenhower will poll, will run strong among the labor groups, the, the u labor union groups in New York State? It's my own impression that there's a very large element among the so-called labor vote that will vote Republican, they voted Republican before. Uh, and not so long ago, if you'll remember, a great many of them must have voted for Bob Taft in Ohio when he was re-elected. And I think they're tax conscious, and I think they're conscious of inflation, and I think a great many of the so-called labor vote will support the Republican ticket. Mr. Kudir, <coughs> there has been a lot of talk about the so-called Negro vote. What do you think about the Negro vote in New York State? Well, of course, I can only, sp yes, I, ca I can only speak for the Negro vote in New York State. Uh, my own impression there again, uh, based upon my knowledge of that, uh, Eisenhower is going to get a great deal of support, I think, from the Negro vote, and rightly so, because it's New York State, after all, that was the pioneer in the Anti-Discrimination Acts. I think the New York legislature was the first uh, state legislature to pass the act. And I think uh, many of our New York Negroes realize that there's far more chance of achieving their aspirations and objectives uh, under a Republican administration in Washington than under a Democratic administration. Well, let's come quickly down to, to the problem in your own district, sir. Now, uh, I believe the presidential uh, candidates are waiting probably until Labor Day to launch their campaigns. Uh, are you waiting until Labor Day to start your campaign? No, no, Mr. Huey, I am not. I have been campaigning unceasingly since about the 15th day of July when uh, opposition uh, petitions were filed in the Republican primary. So I have a primary fight on my hands first, which comes to a head on primary day on August 19th. And after that, if enough Republicans come out to vote for me, I shall have the fight against uh, the Democratic Liberal Party candidate through to election day. Well, that's, so, that's, uh, uh, that's a very interesting situation for our audience because you've actually been out uh, rubbing shoulders and shaking hands already with your constituency. Now, uh, what, uh, what sort of government do you think your constituency uh, wants during the next two to four years? If by that you mean what are people thinking about in the district, I would say the number one issue was taxation. Taxes are eating us alive, all of us, said one editorial in the Daily News one day. And my impression is that the voters in my district are very conscious of the fact that taxes are eating them alive. And that means spending and government waste 
and all that goes with it. I, I think that's almost the number one issue. Subject, of course, to war and defense well, now, and that kind of thing. Now, don't your people in your district uh, think that this country is enjoying great prosperity? I think a great many of our people are, are, are aware of the fact that that's on an artificial foundation, on an inflation foundation, and they're scared to death of where it's going to lead them. And they'd like to get down to a firm foundation of balanced budgets, less public spending, and less taxation. That's the kind of thing that means a, a solid, stable prosperity which assures the future, and more than anything else, assures the future value of the dollars that they save and are now making. Uh, Mr. Kudair, do you think that uh, after the election, if the Republican Party should win the election, a balanced budget will be possible? Do you think with the armament effort and everything that is going on today, it is really possible to reduce taxes and uh, work with a balanced budget? Because that's a very big question, but I think there's a pretty clear answer to it. Certainly there's a far greater chance of balancing the budget on a lower level and reducing taxes in a shorter time with a Republican administration, with Eisenhower in the White House and Republican majorities in both houses. We'll get a much more prudent financial management, we'll have far less waste, we'll have very, we'll have no corruption, and we'll have efficient management. That's bound to mean very large reductions in spending well, and ultimately taxes within the very near future. Well, now you say that your people are, that you think your people are most concerned about the reduction of taxes. Now, is that because of some special characteristics of your constituency? I don't think so. You I don't, don't have any farmers in your... I don't happen to have any farmers, and I suppose perhaps it's because uh, in a city district like mine, there are fewer people who are getting government handouts. So they're less conscious of the handout aspect of government than the pay-in taxes aspect of the government. Your, your constituents are, are on the paying-in They're side. on the paying-out end, and I they're see. very conscious of it, and they don't like it a bit. I see. Now, sir, uh, do you think this, do you think that there are likely to be any surprises this year? Do you think this is likely to be an extraordinary election year in which things that even the political seers uh, won't foresee? Do you think that in, on November the 5th, 1952, that we are likely to wake up with some surprises? Well, I think Governor Stevenson and the Democrats may have some surprises. Uh, it's my impression that there's a very deep-seated and passionate demand for a fundamental change in Washington. I think people are so anxious for a change that they're not going to accept any mere change of face such as Truman to Stevenson. And they're going to insist upon the kind of a change that only comes with a change of party. You and think that, that perhaps there's a large group uh, in the center, for instance, that, uh, that may surprise uh, some of the uh, people who are predicting the election results. That's my confident hope. I think that's what's going to swing the election. Well, Mr. Cadet, I'm sure that our audience has very much appreciated your views tonight, and thank you for being with us, sir. Thank you for letting me come. I enjoyed it. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Gunther Stuhlman. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Frederick R. Couder, Jr., United States Congressman from New York. To the true connoisseur of fine watches, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch. Such discriminating men and women appreciate the elegance of Longines watches, their greater accuracy, and their faithfulness. Worldwide acclaim confirms their judgment. For among the world's fine watches, Longines alone has won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medal awards, and highest honors for accuracy from government observatories. Because of inherent accuracy and dependability, sports and contest associations the world over have made Longines their official watch. Yes, to the connoisseur of fine watches, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines. And yet, do you know, 
that you may buy and proudly wear or give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866. Maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, a distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Colonel Anselm Talbert, an editor of the New York Herald Tribune, and Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Frederick R. Couder, Jr., United States Representative from New York. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Couder, our chronoscope audience, many of them, remember that you uh, inspired the investigation of communist activity in the New York schools recently, and particularly they know you now as a fighting member of the House Appropriations Committee who is trying to do something about what you think is excessive government spending. They're familiar with this uh, rather sensational resolution that you have recently introduced. Now, as the first question, sir, uh, will you tell us first what this resolution is that you've introduced in Congress? Fundamentally, uh, Mr. Huey, this resolution provides the only practical method by which the people of this country can effectively save themselves from complete bankruptcy and stop spending at a reasonable level. All right, now it's a resolution to, to halt spending and to bring it to what you call a reasonable level. Now specifically, how will it do that? The reasonable level uh, that must be applied is the same level that every householder applies in his own personal affairs the limitation must be available income. And available income, in this case, of course, means the proceeds of the intolerably heavy tax burden that the American people are suffering under today. And I say that our government must not and cannot go on spending more than the people are willing and able to pay in taxes. And that's precisely what this administration means to do unless we can stop them. Mr. Kudair. Uh, these aren't normal times, and I wonder just how what you propose would cut into our proposed expenditures for the national defense and for foreign aid. Well, obviously, uh, if any effective reduction is to be made in the fantastic proposals of the president to spend something like $85 billion for three years in a row, there must be some reduction. Uh, in the enormous requests for military funds and some reduction in the foreign aid requests. Now, the 
the suggestion that there be such a reduction is obviously not revolutionary because my resolution was specifically and expressly endorsed at the time I announced it by none other than former Ambassador Douglas, our United States Ambassador to Great Britain, who as much as any other man was responsible for the Marshall Plan and responsible for the development of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now, Mr. Douglas said to me in a letter that uh, a 71 limitation must be adhered to in order to save the solvency and security of the United States. Let's, let's before we kick these billions around, sir, uh, most of us don't know much, uh, don't know the difference between 70 billions and 85 billions. Now, uh, you're telling us tonight that our taxes, these very heavy taxes that have been levied, are likely to bring in about 71 billions during 1952. Is that correct, sir? That is the president's own estimate. I see. Now, and you, do you believe that we have reached the, the wise limit for peacetime taxation? I haven't any doubt about it. But uh, I don't ask you or our listeners to rely upon my opinion. Senator George, who's chairman of the Finance Committee in the Senate, a Democrat, and Mr. Doughton, who is chairman of Ways and Means in the House, which imposes the taxes, and a great many others in the Congress have said we've reached the limit. There aren't going to be. Now, now you, you're saying that there is an agreement between both Republicans and, and Democrats that 71 billions is a tax limit now, that we can't go above that. Agreement isn't exactly the word. There's recognition, recognition. that the people won't pay any more Recognition. Taxes. And the president wants to spend 85 billions or 14 billions right. more. And, and your resolution is designed to prevent that. To prevent and how, how would your resolution prevent that, sir? It would impose by congressional action a limitation of $71 billion upon spending. He would be forbidden to spend a dime more than the $71 billion. And if the resolution passes, he would be required to submit within 30 days a brand new budget dividing up the 71 million piece of pie. Now, is there a growing support for your resolution? What, what evidence is of support have you found, sir? The most amazing evidence of support, quite frankly, indicating perhaps the beginning of a grassroots taxpayers' revolt back home. Only today, uh, Senator Morse of Oregon, who's known as one of the great liberals on the Republican side demanded a $15 billion reduction with $9 billion out of foreign aid and the military establishment. Senator Paul Douglas, also a Democrat uh, from Illinois, uh, uh, one of the favorite liberals on the Democratic side, uh, himself said the other day that we ought to take at least $4 billion out of the military establishment and something <coughs> like a million, billion and a half or two out of the foreign aid program. So. There is a universal expression of desire to cut by a great many of these fellows in the House and Senate, but there's no vehicle to make it effective unless something is done, as is suggested in my resolution. Well, Mr. Kuder, suppose the Chinese Communists march into Indochina this spring. Uh, where would that leave your plan? Do you mean by that, Colonel, that uh, what do we do if there should be another great war scare and a serious threat of immediate third war operations? Yes, exactly. Well, I think the answer to that is very simply that Congress is always in session these days, unfortunately for members and for the country sometimes, so that any uh, legislation that we enact now or any budget that we adopt now on the assumption that we're in for a long pull at high level could be tossed overboard in 24 hours by congressional action. We're always there. Would, would your uh, budget plan prevent enactment of uni uh, legislation for universal military training? I don't think it would affect the matter one way or the other. If the administration and the professional military honestly wanted a UMT, and we're honestly determined to develop a UMT as an alternative to the present uh, intolerably large standing forces, there'd be enormous savings in it. But I don't, I'm not so sure they mean to use it that way. I'm going to wait and see. Congressman, for our listeners tonight, can you illustrate quickly just how these budget arguments in Congress affect the average American family? Well, let the average American family uh, ask uh, itself what its dollars were worth 
10 years ago when they were worth 100 cents and what they're worth today in purchasing power at 53 cents. And when they answer that question, they'll know what excessive federal spending has done. The, uh, the devil in inflation fundamentally is federal spending of more money than we take in in taxes. That is the source of inflation and that is what every American is paying for every morning uh, in the cost of his breakfast food and, his, and uh, his dinner and his radio and his car and everything else. Are you saying that if your resolution can be passed and if the government is held to 71 billions spending this year that that will reduce the threat of inflation? I think it's the surest way to limit inflation and to reestablish something like a sound financial basis in the United States so that people can look forward with some measure to security and certainty in their day-to-day -day operations, always barring, of course, the possibility of an all-out war, which would upset all plans, uh, obviously. Well, how close is your <coughs> resolution to actually being realized? Well, at the moment, it's resting in a heavily weighted New Deal Committee of the House. Uh, a great step forward was made uh, last Monday or Tuesday when the Republican Policy Committee unanimously endorsed it uh, with a very strong statement by Minority Leader Joe Martin of Massachusetts. I think that means that uh, having made it a party issue, our people will press for it. And enough Democrats have committed themselves to the general proposition of substantial reduction that I'm sure if it ever can be gotten to the floor, it will be passed. Now, sir, there are some people I know that would like to help you. Uh, would you like, uh, I'd like your prediction as to whether you can do something now and whether you can get this resolution passed and what can any average American who would like to help you, what can he do, sir? Mr. Huey, uh, despite any fears to the contrary, we are still living in a free country. Americans are still masters of their fate if they choose to assert themselves. All we need is a real grassroots revolt. There is nothing more sensitive uh, on earth than a member of Congress in an election year. All they've got to do is hear from the folks back home and believe me, they'll get action. Now, I believe, sir, and to sum up for our audience, I believe that you say that you are trying to force the government to spend only 71 billions and only what we will be realized from taxes, that you think that you can accomplish that if there are enough American citizens who will write to their congressmen and try to impose a system of economy on the present government. Yes. Thank, thank you very much for being with us, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Colonel Ansel Talbert and Mr. William Bradford Huey. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Frederick R. Couder, Jr., United States Representative from New York. Travelers to the Olympic Winter Games at Oslo, from wherever they come, will find the familiar touch of home in windows of fine jewelry stores. Longines, the world's most honored watch, for the fame of Longines is worldwide. In the mountain high city of La Paz, Bolivia in South America, or historic Athens in ancient Greece, or the sacred city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia, in any of the capitals of 77 countries of the free world, the watch of first choice with discriminating men and women is Longines, the world's most honored watch. The only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy from the leading government observatories. These are Longines watches. And if you pay 71.50 or more for a watch for yourself, or as a gift, you're paying the price of a Longine. Why not insist on getting a Longine, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. Longine, exclusive official watch for the Olympic Winter Games of 1952. This is Frank Knight again. 
inviting you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for The Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.